to me one day and he said, hey, look at these pictures our neighbor, Mr. Murphy's throwing away. And he showed me these great pictures. And I said, I said, Luke, these are album covers. He said, really? What's an album? He's 19. God, I felt old. But I came here today really to talk about the Buffalo Bills. They're my team. I'm still on the payroll over there, although now I'm not a a field rep, I guess is what you'd call it. I'm, uh, I'm in the marketing department. I do their preseason games. I do television shows for them. Um, and they also uh, repay me by doing my shoulder rehab for my shoulder surgery that I had. I did get the rundown from some of the guys. I go down. I don't really go to Buddy Nix or Chan Gailey to find out what the, these guys they drafted are really like. I go down in the bottom of the, of the building and talk to the trainers and the, and the equipment guys and, and those guys who actually uh, talk to these guys and uh, uh, and got, I got to see him away from the spotlight and uh, so I went down and asked and, and found out about some of the new, well the rookies that they brought in and also the draft picks. It's interesting, uh, the Buffalo Bills are the first team to draft an American Chinese uh, player, uh, Ed Wang. Uh, <laughs> all I could think of was Rodney Dangerfield in Caddyshack saying, Wang, it's a parking lot, you know. <laughs> Ed Wang, he's 6'5", 314 pounds out of Virginia Tech, and uh, one of our guys asked him, you know, we have a pretty famous player who came out of Virginia Tech. He was the first player picked in the draft, Bruce Smith. Ed Wang said, yeah, I know. He owns the building I live in <laughs> at Virginia Tech. So Bruce has got a history with him. Ed Wang's 140th overall, and, and you know, you, <clears throat> both of his parents, Ed Wang's parents, were Chinese Olympians. Don't ask me what they did, but they were both in the Olympics for, uh, and represented China. Uh, so he's got a heritage of, of some athletic parents in his genes and also our, the, the marketing department for the Bills is excited because already he's enormous in China. There may be Chinese corporations that want to do a partnership with the Buffalo Bills because of Ed Wang. It's crazy. Uh, but that's how big it is. And you think about it, even 1% of the Chinese population knows who he is. You got like 20 million people who, you know, want to know what the guy's doing. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, he was the fifth round selection for the Bills and 140th overall he was an offensive tackle that was taken. People were wondering why the Bills didn't take an offensive tackle a little earlier in the draft. First of all, the, the offensive tackles that they were going to pick were gone by the number nine pick. The rest of the offensive tackles that were there, the Bills knew they could wait and get a tackle like Ed Wang in the fifth round. Uh, the reason they took C.J. Spiller in the first round, and I don't know if any of you, you want to talk about you know, the YouTube um, you're not going to get a hockey player when you put in C.J. Spiller into the YouTube. You look at his highlights, and the guy's fantastic. Uh, he's very, he ran a 4-3-7, uh, 40 time at the draft, at the combine. He's very fast. Uh, and what I didn't know is the guy's 5'11", 196 pounds. Uh, that's big for a guy who runs that fast. Uh, he's going to be a dynamite player for Buffalo, and he is an outstanding kid. I guess he is absolutely a phenomenal human being. Uh, the people at Clemson said not only is he the best player, one of the best players to ever come through that, that school, they said he may be the best human being. Uh, and he's now a Buffalo Bill, and we're very happy about that. Uh, Terrell Troop is the number two pick, a defensive tackle out of Central Florida. Um, he's 6'3", 314 pounds, and he is also a great character. But you think about this kid, and this is the thing these guys – have to go through and this is a story and I'll tell you about Terrell Troop. Uh, his dad is in jail as we speak and has been there for quite some time. His mother is an addict and Terrell raised his siblings by himself on his own and raised his, raised his brothers and sisters. So that's the kind of guy that you're looking for. He's a great athlete, a defensive tackle, he's a big tough kid. He was very high on the Buffalo Bills draft board. They liked him a lot athletically and also with his character. Uh, and he's also a true uh, a true nose tackle. And the Bills are going from a 4-3 to a 3-4 defense, which for those of you who don't know, uh, in a 3-4 defense there are three down linemen and the guy in the middle, there's two guys on the end obviously and one in the middle who's right on the center as he snaps the ball. You would like uh, a guy that weighs about 200 and, well, You'd like him to weigh about 200 pounds over 300 pounds. And you'd like him to weigh about 500 pounds if you can find a guy like that. I mean, you really need a guy like that. I mean, that's uh, this guy weighs 314 pounds. He's six, three, six feet three inches, 
tall and he's a pure nose tackle and there's a there is an art to it he's not a defensive end he's not a defensive tackle he's a nose tackle which means he is so used to having two guys on him and that's what his job will be you he may not make five tackles all season if he starts and plays every down uh, and he certainly probably won't get any sacks and uh, but what he will do is be double teamed every single play which allows the guys behind him to make plays uh, he will soak up blockers, and that's his job, and that's what a pure nose tackle does. They're the most unselfish player you'll ever come across, and the Bills got a good one in him. Uh, the third pick is a guy named Alex Carrington. He was 72nd overall. Here's a guy, he's 6 feet 5 inches tall and weighs 285 pounds. If I, if I was that big, I'd still be playing. Uh, <laughs> he was a defensive end in 3 4 in college. Uh, he may not get on the field immediately. He's a guy that is a young player that will play some, but not all. He's going to play behind Marcus Stroud for the Bills, and he'll learn his way there. But at 6'5", 285, and an athletic, athletic as he is, uh, he's going to be a defensive end. And one of the things, the reason they get a guy like this is the, the players they have on the team now, like uh, Chris Kelsey, Aaron Mabin, uh, Ellis, uh, those guys are no longer defensive ends. They're stand-up outside linebackers. So we're kind of shy at that position now. So the Bills took this guy uh, for some depth and some help in that position. So it's, uh, it, really, it really looks very good for the guys the Bills have in their draft, particularly in these top four or five guys. Uh, one of the things that came up in the, uh, in the draft, the fourth player they picked right before Ed Wang, they took a man named Marcus Els Easley at 107, 107th pick overall. He's, He's a wide receiver, and he was considered a stretch. He came out of Connecticut, and he's only really had one good year. But the Bills got a hold of him and looked at him. He's six feet two, weighs 216 pounds, and he ran a 4.4 second 40 yard dash. He's an athlete. I mean, a great athlete, and they're really excited about him. He's gonna he's going to push to get some playing time, and they really feel like in the future, perhaps this year some, but certainly in years to come, he's going to be a dynamite player for them. They have great high hopes for him. There are others as well, uh, all, and all I can tell you is I, I have total faith in that. Yet I know you will watch ESPN and you watch the draft, and you watched all that, and you saw how people have ups and downs. You see Mel Kuyper Jr. saying all that stuff. Let me tell you, Mel Kuyper Jr., his payroll is not that big. He may have one other, two other guys, but he asks questions. The Bills have 12 to 14 guys who full-time scour the country for players. They look at everything you can imagine. You look down the list at these guys. We have, you know, we all obviously have one from Clemson. We have one from Central Florida, Arkansas State, uh, James Madison, South Dakota, Troy, and we have one from Iowa. I mean, it, it, we go everywhere. And I tell my, I told, I tell young kids all the time, if you want to play professional football, just go and play someplace because if you're good enough, they'll find you. Um, some of the other schools that the Bills have from rookie free agents, uh, East Carolina, South Dakota State, Wayne State, uh, Howard, Temple, Youngstown State, James Madison, Weber State, UB. I mean, you can go down the list, and they're, they're just not very big schools. They have 12 to 14 guys that do nothing but look for these players. And not only, and I, and I know this, the experts on ESPN has always long been a concern those guys on ESPN, they know these guys, they know what they can do, they, how fast they are, how strong they are. But the Bills have their orthopedic doctors and trainers sit in a, an examination room with these players and they examine them physically. If they've had a knee injury, they get their hands right on that injury and look at it and ask the kid questions and they examine him. They find his medical records and they look at him and have him do exercises. They work him out. They look at him. They ask his coaches, they ask his parents, they ask his high school coaches, they ask his high school and college teachers, they ask his teammates, everything they can find out about all of these guys. They don't pick them by accident. Uh, I have a great deal of faith in the staff of the Buffalo Bills and their ability to pick good players. And the philosophy was to get the team in the position that when the rat draft came about, they would pick the best player on the board, period, regardless of his position. And that's exactly what they did. And they got a steal with their first pick, C.J. Spiller. He was in the top four athletes on the board, the top four, and, uh, and they got him at number nine. So they were very, very happy about it, very pleased.
particularly with the kind of human being he is. I can answer some questions about it, but I also know that some of you remember a time when, when I played for the Bills, and it was a pretty cool team that I played on. It was a fun team to be a part of. I've been associated with the Bills now for 23 or 24 years uh, in the Buffalo area. Uh, I, I got picked up off waivers in 1986, and uh, my wife and I have never left. We came here as newlyweds, and like I say, we have five children, three of them in college. Uh, I have one in, at Cornell, one is graduating from Cortland, and the other is coming out of UB. In fact, my oldest son is the intern for the strength and conditioning coaches of the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> he told me some stuff, too. <laughs> So it's interesting for me to be there, uh, and it's interesting for the guys who were there, still there when I played, to have my son come in and be on the coaching staff in that, in that regard. So it's kind of interesting. But if there's any questions I can answer for you, yes? Uh, Bill Foley and Marv Levy were never shy about being very public about when they look for players, and they look for players that have great intellect and great character. Um, as a fan of that era when you played there, I chose believe them that they were genuine about that. In the 10 years or so since, I would say the record on that has been a little spotty. If you were the general manager of the Bills, could you share with us how you evaluate a pro athlete who's not very bright, has been in scrapes with the law, but is a marvelous physical specimen versus someone from South Dakota State who is a great person seems to be a real dedicated athlete, but physically you wouldn't find right. that person to be the equal. Right. Well, it, it is a balance. There's no question. And uh, when, you're, when you're talking, it seems to be one, you know, you always talk about the extremes, one or the other. Um, and there have been times when, you know, the Bills would bring in a guy, even when Marv and Bill were there, they'd bring a guy in for a look who was, who was questionable. Um, <coughs> I'll give you an This story was told to me just yesterday. I was there when it happened, and I remember the, the incident. But I'll tell you a, a, a story about how things like this work. The Bill, this is the first minicamp after the Bills drafted in, uh, must have been, I can't remember, in the late 80s, maybe early 90s. I think it was the early 90s. And we got a guy named David Brandon, I believe that's his name. He was an outside linebacker and a great athlete, good, good looking guy. I mean, a solid individual, and, and he, they were practicing first day of training camp. I mean first day of mini camp, and this guy was in. We had picked him like in the second round of the draft. Uh, he was a very high draft pick, so he came off, and he, they were out mixing up. He came off the, off the field, and it was this player, Eddie Abramowski, whom you've met, and then Marv Levy and Bill Polian. The kid just happened to come off and be standing there. I don't know. He probably didn't know Marv. He probably didn't know Bill Polian from anybody. You know, just it's just kind of the way it works. And Abe said, "Said okay, you know, you know, you got to go back in." It's a, and the kid had a contusion of his trap, and he's like, he's like, I, I don't know. I just don't think I can do it. They traded him the next day. I'm mean, the next day. He went to San Diego, and. Uh, you got to be willing. Smart guys, tough guys, they dig deep when things go bad. Smart guys dig deep when things go bad, guys with character. And also, intelligent players always improve. Always. Other guys don't. Guys who are less intelligent or don't care, don't have that commitment, don't improve. So you'll get, he'll be the same player in year eight that he was in year one if he makes it to year eight. Uh, but you're right, there is always a balance between character and good, you know, good players and the outstanding athlete who has had scrapes with the law. And those are the extremes. The problem comes in this. For instance, the Bills last season. They go and they've got, they, they lose three tackles. And they lose four tackles before, you know, during the season. The, the pool of players that you can actually even consider signing is so small, you, get a, you have a choice between two guys that really wouldn't be in the National Football League anyway, and oh, this guy has had this many scrapes with the law, this one's had this many. That's the choice you have to make. And you think, well, as long as one of them doesn't have an ax in the back of his car, we'll take him. <laughs> and they come in and they stay there for as long as they can make themselves worthy. Or if they come in and, they, and they, the guy comes in and says, listen, I've, 
I want another chance and I will make the best of it. I promise you, you won't regret it. That goes a long way. If you can look the guy in the eye and he'll give you that. But you're right, it is a difficult balance. A difficult balance. And plus you have to remember, you have to think about where the sources come from that you get your information from. Somebody else might have an ax to grind. Or the coaching staff in the college that says, hey, this guy's a great guy, we love him. They want him to be drafted as high as possible because it helps their recruiting. They don't think the guy's a great guy. So, yes? Quarterback. Quarter? Quarterback. Quarterback. Starters on the roster somewhere. <laughs> I think it's going to be an open competition. Um, you've got a guy from Stanford, a guy from Princeton, a guy from Troy. Oh, this guy from Troy, um, his name is, I don't know his name. His name is Kyle Calloway. No, that's not right. Levi Brown. 6'3", 219, he's got all the physical abilities, big arm, good athlete, they like him physically, but yeah, he's a rookie. So, and I think one of the things this coaching staff, and you get this a lot with coaching staffs who change, when new coaches come in, they always invariably think they can push the right buttons to get a player to play better than the other coaching staff did. And sometimes they don't have to push buttons, all the player needs is a fresh start. Uh, a lot of things are going to change for the Bills this year. The offense is going to change. The defense is going to change. And this coaching staff feels confident that the best thing to do going forward is to see if they can get more out of the guys they've got because they never really got an opportunity to pick a guy where they needed to pick him in the draft. And certainly they don't feel like there's anybody out there in the free agent market. That's the reason. Now, they would, if, you know, they thought long and hard about Ben Roethlisberger. Because there's a guy who, who's had problems, big problems. And while coming out of there, I mean, the, he seems to have learned his lesson. You'd like to think so. Maybe you think about giving him a chance. Don't know. But they didn't do that. So the price was probably too high. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, in the back. What's your projection and insight on the Buffalo Bills staying in Buffalo, Western New York? That is a $64 question. They, as long as Ralph owns the team, they're not going anywhere. Uh, when the team is no longer Ralph's, it depends on how the change of ownership is handled. Either it will be put up for auction, in which case it will not stay in Buffalo, or there will be a plan already have put in place with an ownership group where that's already part of the decision-made process already. So it's, the decision's already been made, or it won't stay in Buffalo. It, there's no, that's the only way financially you can make it happen is for the team to stay in Buffalo, is if the decision's already been made and it's a secret. And it, that's which very well could be. Because there are, if, a, if an NFL, if you want to buy an NFL club, you have to be pre-approved by the National Football League, which means the owners vote on whether you're a worthy candidate or whether they have a problem with you or and you have to pass certain criteria. You have to have the, the money, you have to have uh, a plan, and you have to have, they like to have one guy who owns most of, if not every single bit of the team. Because they don't want three guys owning the team, they want one. Uh, if you can pass that criteria, you can buy the team. There are about Last I heard, there are about 10 groups who have that pre-approval. Some of them are people you know, some of them are people you don't. Uh, but that's the pool. And depending on who acquires the team, that will tell you in an instant whether the team will stay or not. Yes? When you hear Marv Levy's off quote, where would you rather be than right here, right now? Other than being here today, of course. Right, the Jackson uh, Center. Yeah, Jackson Center. Uh, what, that, what does that evoke? Because that was a pre-game speech. Yeah, you know, he didn't do that the whole year. He kind of came up with that at, like, my gosh, he was there 11 years, 11 and a half years with me. And, I mean, he came, that kind of came in the early 90s, like after we'd been there four or five years. And we were good. And it was and it was true because when he, I kind of remember, and I, I, I really don't know when he first said it, but when Marv first said, where would you rather be right here, right now, we played in a lot of games where we knew we were going to win before the game started. You know, occasionally you get that feeling. That doesn't guarantee anything, but you sure, certainly have that feeling. And that was, it was fun to be on that team, you know, when you knew you were going to win. And uh, 
when when I think about Marv saying that, I mean, you know, you think of the sunshine being in what was then Rich Stadium. Um, there was nothing like it. Yeah, it was a, it was a very very special group of men that made that team and that organization. Not just the players, but the coaches, the front office people. It was a real symbiotic group, you know, a real synergistic group that that came together and stayed together for a long time and st remained close friends um, all these twenty years later. So it's. Uh, it evokes a lot of memories for me. There's a lot of good men in that group. Speaking of good men from that group, uh, give us your best Shane Conlon story. Shane Conlon story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I no, we used to tease Shane because Shane had the... We used to tease him that when, when anybody got injured on the field, they had to use Shane's helmet to put on top of the golf cart to come and get him because his helmet was enormous. <laughs> Enormous helmet with chicken legs. <laughs> he was uh, he was a great player, a great player, and um, he was one of the first guys I remember who was a great player. And we lost. You know, he went to he went to the Rams, and that was you know he missed him. He really missed him. You know he was a good player, so productive, so sharp, and you know and, and then to have him be able to sign someplace and go someplace else, it really hurt us. Really hurt. And it hurt the it hurt the chemistry, you know. Um, he was a good guy to have because he would, you know, in a football locker room, there's always the offensive guys and the defensive guys. So there's kind of an automatic, you know, a petition there, you know, an automatic wall there because you play against, you know, each other in practice and and you go to meetings separately and that kind of thing. And he was one of those guys that kind of bridged that. And uh, so he missed him when he was gone. Uh, but for a Shane story, not one that I could repeat, no. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about current day bills or anything like that? I Yes? How problematic that was? And could you, could you tell who was on and who wasn't? Well, when you say back then, when I first came in the National Football, I was drafted in 1985, so it was 25 years ago. Um, every big guy in the NFL was on steroids. It's not I'm, well. Then there's yeah. They didn't say you couldn't do it, and it helped. I mean, they were they don't say enhancing for nothing. Um, every big guy did it, or not every big guy, but a huge percentage of them did. Uh, not so many, not so many of the little guys. Uh, I know I didn't do it. I. And it's not because I'm you know, this high, you know, high character guy. I just I couldn't afford him. <laughs> as a college kid, and I would have gotten on him when I was in college had I been started doing him. But I, you know, I was a college. If I had five bucks in my 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 wallet at college, it was you know it was payday. But uh, I just couldn't afford him. And plus, I didn't understand them, and you know, and so I didn't ever use them. Once I got to the NFL and I I made it without them, I was like, well, I, you know, I don't I didn't need them. But all the big guys were on them then. And then in 1987, we went on strike. That was one of the issues uh, that the league wanted to, to address because they could see it down the road. It was going to cause guys problems later in life. Uh, it tilted the field. Um, and, you, you know, you used to talk about some of the old-time players. It, at, at the time when it was ascending and becoming a part of the National Football League, it was a huge, huge advantage for those players who had or teams who it was on that team and another team that wasn't so prevalent. It was, you know, the, that team would dominate. So uh, at the 87 player strike, it became an issue, and then they began to, to test for it randomly, which is the key thing. And, you know, I think now you, you can't get away with it. I mean, if, if you're getting away with it, it's because you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. So it, that precludes a lot of guys being able to afford it like I couldn't. But I, I think now I would be shocked if, if there was – a large percentage at all, if any, of guys who are actually doing it. I mean, they, I mean, they may have stuff that you can't tell, but when you look back in the day when I first came in the league, I mean, I, you could look around the room and just point fingers. You, could, you knew it. I mean, and that was, you know, guys just, you know, it wasn't open. It wasn't open like that. Guys didn't talk about it. It was very quiet and hush hush, but yeah, it was understood. That I don't know. That I don't know. I know that it, it I don't know that they were. I don't think it was a policy decision for major colleges to have. I don't, but I know kids came out of college. And did. I know they were uh, a small part of the, the roster in my college, Northwestern University, 
for different guys. But yeah, I mean, it, it permeated the, the the game at every level at that time. But now I think they've. That's you used to see guys. You used to see guys six five, two hundred and eighty five or ninety pounds playing offensive tackle with a thirty six inch waist. You don't see a thirty six inch waist at tackle in the NFL anymore because they change. They carry the weight in a natural way. So that when you see a guy like that, you raise his eyebrows. Yeah. Yes, right here. Since it was on YouTube at the beginning, what do you think about uh, special team players being in the Hall of Fame? Special teams players in the Hall of Fame? You can make a case for it, but it's a case you're going to lose. <laughs> you know, it's nice to think about, and I'm flattered that I'm in the conversation, but. It's, it's hard to sell that. It's hard to sell it because, it, you know, for so many years, so many decades, it was players who were lesser athletes and lesser, uh, lesser players who played special teams. It was backups. Um, that wasn't necessarily the case when I was in the league because, and my thought is, when the league raised the roster to 53 players and there was no salary cap, that was really the golden era of special teams because teams had room on the roster for guys who may not play if they didn't do play special teams. So if they knew they weren't going to play, teams would say, well, shoot, let's keep the better special teams player and get an edge, maybe get a block kick or force fumble, or at least help our field position. So during that era, teams like the Bills kept players specifically for special teams. That was it. I'm, I'm, you know, I would, and plus, if, if you were even if I was good enough to play wide receiver, which I was later in my career, who are you going to sit down? Andre Reed or James Lofton? <laughs> if I'm going to get on the field, I got to be out two Hall of Famers. That's a tough roster to make, you know. So yeah, you can make a you can make a case for it. And if, if anybody asks you if they say special teams a third of the game, only 20% of the plays are special teams plays. 20, one out of every five. But for three reasons, they're different. One is it's, 60, it's 40 to 60 yards of field position is tr exchanged, which is crucial in the game. Secondly, it's when the only time when a team deliberately gives the ball to their opponent. And the third is a direct try for points, a field goal or extra point or something like that. So those three things, field position, the changeover, and, and the scoring, are why the 20% of special teams plays are magnified to being considered a full third of the game. Comment on Roger Goodell? I like Roger Goodell. I think he's an excellent commissioner. Uh, he asked me if my comment on Roger Goodell. He's very. He's an excellent commissioner. Uh, I was in the era. My the beginning of my era. My time in the league was with Pete Rozelle, uh, and then Pete retired, and and uh, uh, David uh, no, Paul Tagliabue took over, and the league really blossomed with Paul Tagliabue as commissioner. It went from a seven hundred million dollar industry with 32 teams to now it's 14 billion I mean it's it's unbelievable it's, it's enormous it's a monster and uh, now Roger with Roger at the forefront he's he's perfectly positioned I think he's got the right expertise to really help the league polish itself and stay and stay where it should be um, now it's exciting to see I like Roger a lot and he started at the bottom of the league and worked his way all the way to the commissionership, and I think that's exactly where you need to pick your commissioner from. Yeah, I'm excited. I like Roger, and I think he's outstanding. Yeah. Steve, could you walk us through your preparation for, let's just say, the last year's Super Bowl? What is a normal week? Last year's Super Bowl, walk you through just my your normal process. Well, Super Bowl ain't no normal week, pal. I got news for you. <laughs> uh, well, last year's Super Bowl, I got to, the game was on Sunday. I got into Miami, South Florida on Monday before. Um, and we had some meetings immediately with the pregame show. Uh, and, uh, our, and our broadcast crew was myself, Solomon Wilcox, as sideline reporter. Solomon was the Saints sideline reporter. I was the, the Colts sideline reporter. Uh, and along with Phil Sims and Jim Nance in the booth for the game and uh, we per started to prepare and basically what I did was when Phil and Jim went to watch the Colts practice I went with them when they had production meetings when we sat down with Peyton Manning and at a, a, a table just like these we sat with Peyton Manning and and talked to him about the game and, and uh, what was going to happen in the game what he worried about in the game we talked to uh, Dwight Freeney about his foot 
and about how he was feeling for the game. Uh, and of course, we talked to Jim Caldwell and spent a great deal of time with him. Uh, I believe, if I remember right, because I'm getting the championship game and the Super Bowl movie mixed up, I think we had the coordinators come in as well and spoke to them. Uh, and Phil watches, you know, film, fi films, Phil's kind of a film junkie, so he watched a lot of film. Uh, then uh, we talked about how we wanted the game to look on Sunday, and plus all my the responsibilities that Solomon and I had that were separate from the game. We had to go to the hotel. When the, the teams go to the Super Bowl, sometimes the night before the game, they'll leave their ho hotel they've been in all week and go to a different hotel because it gets crazy. Uh, the Saints did not do that, and the Colts did. And the Colts did everything exactly like they did three years earlier at Super Bowl Forty One. Same hotel, same hideaway hotel, same thing. In fact, uh, for those of you who don't know it, a couple of the coaches on the Colts staff are very good friends of mine. Uh, Pete Metzlars, who was the tight end for the Buffalo Bills, is, the, is now the full offensive line coach for the Colts. And Frank Reich is the quarterback's coach for the Indianapolis Colts. So I, we, t we tease Frank about how, you know, how good a coach you got to be for Peyton Manning, you know? I mean, <laughs> Who's coaching who? You know, uh, but but uh, so I had I had breakfast with Pete Metzlars, which is in the exact same booth in the exact same restaurant we did three years earlier for their Super Bowl when they won against the Bears, uh, and then we were in a, a police escort back to the stadium so we could get to the stadium and the complex and the complex the CBS puts up uh, is probably about eight five maybe five acres of trailers and offices temporary offices we put up and we stay there for the entire Super Bowl week. Um, and everybody, the, uh, CBS Sports moves to Miami and we're right at the stadium. And then we're in and out of the stadium doing stuff, watching the game, watching warm-ups, talking to people we know all during the game and and uh, and we just do the game. I mean, that That is a chaotic day, uh, to say the least, on Super Bowl Sunday at that game from, from midnight to midnight. It's crazy. Um, and then for a no more normal game, I would get in on a Friday morning for a Sunday game, watch the home team practice. Um, the next day we would, and I'd talk to their pl couple, three or four of their players and their head coach. The next day we would walk to the, talk to the head coach and the players for the visiting team who get into town on Saturday before the game the day before. We'll talk to them at their hotel. Then we'll have a big meeting that night at our hotel and we'll see all the, in, the inserts that we're going to put, statistics we want you to see on the game. Uh, stories we want to talk about, video clips and little highlight reels we'll put in the game. We'll watch all those to make sure everything's right, spelled right, and looks right, and sounds right. Uh, then we get up the next morning, go out and uh, and do the game. Do the game. Um, it's a Friday to Sunday travel day f week on a regular game. Um, that's exactly what we did for the uh, championship game this year in Indianapolis too, between the Jets and the and the and the uh, Colts. We went. On, I went on a Friday. Does the NFL require the athletes to participate with you, or do you get pushback at some point? Uh, we can get pushback. That the athlete can say no, unless uh, usually unless it's the quarterback. Well, I guess the quarterback could say no in certain situations, but they they know too. They're told when they're the starting quarterback, they will do a production meeting with the team that's doing the game. Uh, now we'll go down the list of players. Now you'll have some players that will just say, "I do not do those." Period. I'm done. I'm not doing them, and they won't. So we'll ask another player. Uh, but for the most part, yes, we get access that nobody else does. No question. Particularly the head coach. Uh, he'll give us inactives. He'll give us injury reports the day before the game that maybe they don't want anybody to know. They'll give us some coaches are different. I mean, um, there are some coaches who tell you whatever you want to know. I'm mean, literally. I'm mean, say, listen. I'll say, what do you, th you know, what are you going to do? And to this, you know, against their defense because they, you know, they're. You know, they got that strong front seven. He goes, well, here's what's going to happen. We're going to be able to protect. They can't rush our passer, and their cornerbacks suck. <laughs> we're going to go after them on the outside, and we're going to win. We're going to do it. We're going to do it early, and we're going to go deep right off the bat. You want, if you want to, he said, and we'll say, well, can we put our camera on? Which receiver we want to put our camera on first? He goes, you put your camera on 82. He's getting the first pass of the game opening. So if it's first and ten on the twenty or better after a kickoff return, and if we don't do something stupid and fumble it inside our ten and we're backed up, but if it's normal down and distance, we're going to go deep to number eighty-two right now. 
first play of the game. So we'll set it up, and we'll have cameras all over every angle. We'll watch the pass rush. We'll have a, an ISO on that receiver from ground level behind him, and also opposite end looking back. We'll have a, a side all, all looking at that guy. So we'll have every angle of that catch. And, you know, some coaches will do that for you. And, they'll, and I'll give you an example, too. In this last championship game, we'll talk to the court. We was talking to the quarterback. And Peyton Manning and Phil Simms started talking. And I, and I got to be honest with you, there were times when I couldn't understand a word they were saying. Because Phil Simms is a film junkie. He's a very good analyst. And he used to be a quarterback, in which those guys are a little different. And Peyton Manning is, for those of you who know, I mean, he's a Ph.D. So, in, in football. So... Phil starts asking him specific questions about coverages and fronts. So he'll say, what are you going to do if they drop that safety down on the under defense and you've got that protection, you've got your tight end to the other side, and Peyton goes, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll shift slide the protection, we'll just keep that guy in, we'll just slide him away, and we'll slide one extra guy to that side, and then we'll, and then we'll run the route to the weak side. And they say, okay, well, what happens if that, and they, go, da, da, da. And they start, and all of a sudden they're starting to finish each other's sentences. And I'm like, I just laid my pen down. I'm not even taking it. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> but then he said, he said, before the Jets game, he said, they played the Jets. And it's an interesting situation because they played the Jets in week 15 or 16. Bef two weeks before the game season was over. The, the Colts have it wrapped up. They have home field advantage. Peyton Manning plays half the game, and they're done. And the Jets get into the playoffs because of it because they win that game against the Colts. Well, in that game, the Colts said, well, Peyton said, well, we didn't show them anything. We, we ran two wides and two tight ends and one back the whole game. That's the only personnel combination we used. We had the whole game like we didn't show them anything because we knew we might meet them. There's a possibility of meeting them later, and we didn't need the game, so we just played. And I didn't even play the second half, which we knew. But he, so that's what we did. He goes, so the, I want. He, Peyton said, I want to find out what they're going to do to our three wide package. If we put three wides and one tight end, Dallas Clark on the side as a tight end, I want to know what they're going to do in the coverage against it. Uh, I don't know how they're going to attack it. Are they going to cover it? Are they going to, you know, uh, so I want to know that. That's the question coming in this game for me. So we get into the meeting with Rex Ryan, the head coach of the Jets. And we said, what are you going to do? You know, and he's a lot, you guys played him three weeks ago. And he said, yeah, we played him a couple of weeks ago, but they ran nothing but two tight ends, one back, and two wide outs. We didn't get to see him do that three wide thing. And what's that mean? He goes, well, they can run that three wide. They can either block it up with two tight ends and go single back like they did last game, or they can go to that three wide package and get their quarterback killed. That's what we're going to do. We're going to rush him. So we knew. He, says there, he said, and they did too. In that championship game, the Jets sacked him twice in the first quarter and a half. The problem was Peyton figured it out, and then they beat him by, you know, by 10, I think, or 13 points. They got a couple of big plays because then, and then, and to his credit, Greg Williams, former head coach of the Buffalo Bills, is the defensive coordinator of the Saints. So he sees that game, and he sees what we see. Quarter and a half, the Jets were all over them. They were going to win that game. They had him. Well, then Peyton figured the stinking game plan out. The defense had. So what Greg Williams did is he had a game plan for the first half of the game in the Super Bowl, but in the third quarter when it started. They took that one and ripped it up, and they had another one. And they did a completely different defense for the second half. And then at the end of the third quarter, they ripped that one up and had one for the fourth quarter. So they didn't give Peyton Manning a chance to look at their defense and figure out what they were doing, and they won the game. They won the game because of it. It was brilliant. And it was great chess match strategy that, that's way above a lot of other sports in their ability to do. You know, And it's when you get a guy like Peyton Manning, he changes it for a lot of people, not just the players on the field, but the coaches who have to coach against him and coach him. It's it's amazing. It was fun to see. Fun to see. I just rambled on there. I apologize. How your transition came about from player to television analyst? Well, I, I, I had graduated from Northwestern University with a communications degree. I wanted to be in television when I was done. And while I was playing, I, I interned with Channel 7 in Buffalo, the ABC affiliate. Big. And over week after week after week, we were we were killing people. So the team was hot, and I was on every Monday, and people just tuned in to watch it because they had, you know, we did some cool stuff. Well, then the next year, I got my own show. <laughs> so word got out that when I was done, I wanted to get into the broadcasting into football, and and um, in in preparation for that, I got to know everybody at NBC. NBC had the the football package 
the AFC football package. So all those games in the early 90s were done by NBC. And I would go into those production meetings that I just told you about, and I would talk to the, the announcers and the producers and say, hey, and so they knew me and they knew I was interested in that kind of thing. And then when I retired after the 97 season, NBC lost the NFL. So they don't even do football anymore. And I was like, oh, man. I, you know, I thought I completely blew it. But, as it turned out, it was perfect because CBS not only was getting the NFL, but they were hiring all new people. So I got called in to New York for a, a, a screen test uh, on the set of NFL Today. I screen tested with Jim Nance and uh, Randy Cross. And uh, on St. Patrick's Day, uh, 1998, I was the only sober soul in Manhattan. <laughs> I had it. I was, you know, I was a coat and tie and a, and a top coat and with a briefcase walking down, and, and it, every soul there was drunk. The cops too. So, not really. The cops were in the parade. I don't know. So anyway, so I, I make it there. I get the, con I get the, I do the screen test, and they offered me a position as an analyst a couple of weeks later, and uh, I obviously accepted. And I've been there ever since. And in fact, one of the the guys you saw on the. On the video, uh, the good-looking black guy, Gus Johnson, he's my play-by-play -play guy with CBS. We work together every week, and that's why he's pounding my drum to get in the Hall of Fame. He likes me. We're friends. <laughs> I'm, his, I'm his boy. You know, I, Gus is great, and he's a he's a phenomenal anal he's a phenomenal play-by-play -play guy. He's the guy on NCAA basketball that does the excited call, and. Uh, it's all real too. I mean, the guy's the guy's the best, and I think he's the best in the business. And I love working. I, I, I was really blessed to get a working. That's how my transition went. I just got, I absolutely timed it right and got lucky. Yes. I do not know. I do. Not, I never got a chance to play with him. Um, he was before my time. I do not know where George is. I haven't heard, not heard. I think he's he's alive. I hear about that. I mean, we hear about those things in the building when. A former player passes away, or anything like that. but yeah, I I do not know. I can't answer that. Yeah. Yes. As you look back at your career with the Bills, hundreds of games, of course. But is there one that you picture as your defining moment? Um, one the, a game that I picture as my defining moment. I don't know. That's hard. That's hard for me. No, I have a lot of great memories. I mean, I can, you know, I'm, I like, I'm like a fan. I mean, you look at different areas of the field. I can look at numbers on the field or a corner of an end zone or whatever, and I can remember plays that happened at that moment and, and at that point, at that place, in that spot on the field. Um, and, you know, it's hard to, to go back in time. I remember plays uh, and games. I remember the 51-3 to game uh, and the excitement in the city. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, a couple of pro plays I made in the Pro Bowl. Uh, I was MVP of the Pro Bowl in '93. Uh, I think that made that raised some people's eyebrows when I was able to do that. Um, that changed some people's perception. I remember, you know, there was a tackle on there that I made on Deion Sanders, who, who's a good friend of mine. I know him really well. Um, you know, I, so things like that. I'm Rod Woodson. I tackled Rod Woodson a couple of times. You know, I mean, I, um, so there are plays that do that. Um, but I think I'm like everybody else. When you when you do something for that long, it's the people you remember. And who you remember the most? Well, like Frank, right? Pete, Mets, Lars, Jim. I see. I Jim and I, I we just saw. I saw Jim, Jim Kelly, uh, um, Kent Hull. You know um, all these guys. Um, Will Wolford. They were at Kent Hull's golf tournament last Monday. You know, we eight, eight, eight days ago. I see Thur Thurman lives five minutes from me. Jim lives four minutes from me. Mark Kelso lives a couple of minutes from me. Your kids get together for like football. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the kids are busier than their their dads are. I know that at this point. But I, see, you know, I and I have, you know, I have lunch occasionally with Jim and Thurman, and uh, guy from the Bills. Yeah, we have we get together. We're friends. I mean, we're old old friends, and we treat each other as such. Uh, those are the guys. I'm, I get I talk to Pete whenever I do a, an Indianapolis game. I talk to him, and he calls me occasionally. Anyway, Chris Moore lives down in Thompson, Georgia, just away, just outside of Augusta. I saw him at Chris at Kent Hulls. They're just the list goes on and on and on. There are guys in Buffalo. Marlon Kerner still lives in Buffalo. Marlo Perry. I see those guys occasionally. Um, 
it's just it was just a wonderful organization to be a part of, and it's like we spoke about in the first thing. Most of those guys are quality individuals, very quality individuals, and uh, it's great to see them and great to see, and they're in the community. They're in the community working and doing things. Steve, wide right. Wide right. What about it? Talk, talk about the setup and feelings. It's and the only game when that kick went wide. That's the only time I ever lost a game where I could physically feel it. <laughs> I could physically, I had a knot in my stomach that, that would not go away. In fact, I think when that kick went wide, that made it possible. Um, when that kick went wide, that kick was the reason that team went to four straight Super Bowls. That kick. Because we, The next year when we went back to Super Bowl 26 against probably the best team I ever saw, the, the Redskins team, Leading up to the, the playoff run, the playoffs, getting through that run to that Super Bowl was the most stressful time of my entire life. And I know I'm probably not alone when I say that. I wouldn't miss a practice. Other guys wouldn't miss a practice. We showed up to work sick. Uh, we played when we shouldn't have been playing. We just could not live with ourselves if we didn't get back to the Super Bowl. We just couldn't let it happen. And, uh, and of course it didn't. but. We absolutely were bent on going back to that Super Bowl and winning it, and uh, um, it was the most stressful time I've ever, I ever witnessed in that locker room, and certainly for myself personally. Uh, but that kick going wide is what set that team, that organization, up for four straight Super Bowls. No question in my mind. Yeah. Had enough. <laughs> This has been great. Really appreciate Steve making the extra effort. And we've got a check here to Steve for his favorite charity, uh, the Heritage, Heritage Christian Services. And to Steve, to Westher, thank you very much. If anybody has a question or two, Steve might be here for a second. Uh